everybody achieved this goal. Um, but the story was that this is an objective feature that makes a life worthwhile, makes life valuable, objectively worthwhile. Um, Hobbes obviously can't say that because he denies that there is such a thing as the objective good life. So the question for Hobbes of why be moral, he can't simply argue that morality is part of the objective form of the good life because he doesn't think there is such a thing as the objective form of the good life. What's valuable, what's good, is what we happen to desire. This is what makes ends valuable. So he can't simply argue that morality is part of, constitutes part of our proper end. Um, but he does want to answer this question. Um, so the problem is that often there's a conflict between what we desire and what morality requires of us. Often the things that we desire, and therefore for a Hobbes, the things that we would call good, conflict with what morality requires. So how can Hobbes say that morality is good? How can we say that justice is valuable if we don't have a desire for it? And I assert to you, sometimes we don't have a desire for it. Sometimes what morality requires of us is exactly contrary to what we would prefer, to what we have a desire for. Morality is sometimes hard. So on a teleological approach, not opposite, on a teleological approach, we can say that the desires that we have that conflict with the requirements of morality are bad desires. Something seems subjectively to be good, like robbing the bank or betraying your friend or whatever, that seems attractive to you, but you're wrong about it. It's not actually a good thing. Your life actually would be better if you didn't satisfy those desires. But Hobbes has a hard time saying that. Because for Hobbes, Whatever it is that we desire, we call good. And there's no independent assessment or evaluation. OK, so Hobbes can't show, can't argue, that morality and justice form part of our necessary ends, our goals, our objective ends. So there's only one possibility left. He wants to be able to answer the question, why be moral? He does want to say that morality and justice are good. He can't say that morality and justice form part of our objective ends. What's the only other possibility? How can he say something is good? If not, look, so, so the fact is we don't all have this as a desire. Sometimes our desires conflict with, with the requirements of justice and reality. So it's not our end. He can't. It's not always all of our end. So we can't say that it's good because we have a desire for it. Right? right? What's the only other possibility? He does want to say, he does want to make the case, he does want to argue that justice and morality are good. How can he do it? Seeing that desires of a person is at fault, maybe? Um, so if you're just looking at the desires themselves, there's no basis on which to say they're at fault. In other words, if it's just looking at those desires, we have to say that they're, the ends are good, even if they conflict with morality. Unless what? What if being morality is a means? Right. Because you're generally trying to be nice so that people will hire you, be your friend, whatever. Good. All right, so whatever the story is, that's going to, whatever the details of the story will be, that's how he's going to have to approach it. He's going to have to say that morality and justice are good 
not because we have a direct desire for that, but because morality and justice will be means to achieve the satisfaction of whatever it is that we desire. So what he has to show is that morality and justice will be instrumentally valuable for something or some things that we, in fact, do desire. So it would be, what he wants to argue is, it would be irrational for us to be immoral. It would be irrational for us to be unjust. Irrational in the sense that I've just been talking about. Irrational in the instrumental sense. Irrational in the sense that if we fail to be just and moral, then we will fail to take the proper means to achieve the satisfaction of our desires. And what I want to emphasize, that so, so look, this is not at all obvious. He has to argue this. He has to make the case. He has to try to establish that morality and justice, being moral and just, really will help you achieve the satisfaction of your desires, whatever they are, or maybe almost they are for a very wide range of desires. Um, I want to emphasize that this is a, a very hard task that he set himself here. I mean, he set himself the project of trying to show that, I mean, maybe it's an impossible task. He set himself the project of trying to show that Whatever it is that we desire, whatever it is that we call good, will also rationally, on that basis, call justice and morality. Or we should, anyway. If we don't, we're being irrational. Um, that is, I'll say it a slightly different way. From each person's own subjective point of view, they're based on the desires that they happen to have. From each person's subjective point of view, Hobbes wants to show that morality and justice make sense. Morality and justice, from your point of view, no matter what desires, almost, that you happen to have, <coughs> you will see, if you think properly about it, from the basis of your subjective desires, morality and justice are good, are good on the basis of your subjective desires. Um, everybody should be able to see from their own point of view, based on the desires that they themselves have, that they have a reason to be just, that they have a reason to be wrong. Um, so, so, although Hobbes is a subjectivist about value, maybe about the foundation of He's not a subjectivist about morality and justice. He wants to try to establish the objectivity, in a certain sense, of justice and morality on a basis of subjective value. And this instrumental approach is how he's going to try to do it. Yes? Um, what if, I don't mean to be honest, what if there is a person that makes a deep desire not just for the heck of it, but makes a desire and he really desires it to be moral in life and that's just his desire. Sure. So what if somebody really likes, that is, they have a desire to be kind and gentle? In that case, Hobbes' project will be really easy. But what if the other? Right. So what about somebody who makes it there, who has a desire to be really mean and um, what? unfair, cruel to other people. Yeah, Hobbes does think that there may be some people something like that. Um, he, he will try to show that even they have a reason to be just. But if you really press the point strongly enough, I think he would have to concede that he'll have to, that he will have to exclude those individuals, that he's going to fail to establish that they have a reason to be just. 
And so we, at a certain point, he does have to make certain, maybe limiting assumptions about the desires that human beings typically have. So we'll see that, I think. I think he could still make that argument, though, because he could do, make the argument on, in the sense of saying that not for that particular desire or end will you have to be just or moral, right, right. but you'll, you have other well, desires and ends sure. in your life besides one. And sure. in turn, you will use just justice and morality to get to those other ends. Good. So what you're relying on there is kind of an assumption about human nature, namely that people aren't only interested in pursuing this one desire, yeah. that most people, maybe all people, have other desires that maybe we can leverage. Right. So that's exactly the kind of thing that I would want to say. That human beings, in fact, aren't aren't singularly concerned with being equal to each other. Or singularly concerned with being good to each other. That's true too. But, yeah. Um, so the problem case is going to be, what if we construct somebody with desires that simply conflict with the requirements of justice and no others? And then I think we have to see that he's not going to fail. But the point is, Human beings, you might want to argue, aren't like that. Yeah. So it doesn't, doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, so that's the project, right? That's what Hobbes has set himself to do. Um, so we have um, a few more points before we actually get to see him making this case. So in chapter 10, um, he's talking about power. This is on page 50. Um, he says the power, first paragraph, the power of a man is his present means to obtain some future apparent good. And this he says is either original or instrumental. So instrumental power is the power to acquire new powers. The power to acquire um, an ability to get other. So power is the ability to accomplish some end that we desire. That is the power to get some good, because that's what it is to desire some end. Instrumental power is simply the power to get us more power. So it's a sort of second order power. Uh, so something that allows us to acquire more means to our end is an instrumental power. Um, so what's an example of that? So it has education, an example of that. Well, my daughter is smart to make some money, but uh, if you look for education, then you be smarter, you have certain knowledge that will make you be able to make money. Right, and it's, uh, and it's not simply direct to one particular end. Education maybe will allow you to acquire a variety of different means to different ends. Right, what else? Yeah. Are you money? Money, sure. So money is a good example. It allows you to acquire a variety of different means that would be useful to a variety of different ends. Good. Okay, so those are examples of instruments. Okay. Um, what else? Hobbes gives the example of people. And so that if you can get somebody to do what you want, get somebody else to do what you want, well, then you can use them for a variety of different ends. Sure. Um, 